Hey everyone, it's Sunday morning, it's 11 o'clock and you're so very welcome to worship here at Central with us in the heart of Belfast. Uh, wherever you are today, it's our prayer that God meets with you, uh, that you encounter him through his word, through song, uh, through the preaching, uh, maybe through pre-service prayer, if you've already been on that with us this morning. It's just our prayer that, that God meets with you where you are uh, today. I just want to have a couple of things I want to run through uh, before I, I hand over to Hannah, who's leading us in worship today, and then to Lucy, uh, who's going to be preaching in the last of the series uh, that we've been in over the last little while. The first thing is to say I am deeply sorry that last week I did not mention Mother's Day. Uh, that is no uh, reference to how much we care for and love those of you that are part of our church community who are mothers. We hope you were blessed, ate too much, uh, got some time off, lay in, whatever, last Sunday, all of you mothers mothers out there. Happy belated Mother's Day a week late to you. The next thing I want to mention uh, really is just our midweek rhythm. So last week uh, we had worship at home. Uh, thanks so much to Hannah and to Stuart who led that so beautifully for us. Uh, we really hope that you were able to make space on Wednesday night or at some other stage through the week uh, to meet with God in your homes and that as they led, they were able to lead you to him, whether you were drawing, whether you were just lying on the sofa, whether you were singing along. Uh, we have been so grateful for that space in the last year as we long for time together lifting Jesus name here in the building together um, it's been such a blessing to be able to uh, log in online and to get some time with those guys leading us in worship so thank you to Hannah to Stuart and to Jamie for pulling that all together uh, we're so grateful for all you do in leading us in worship in this particular season this coming week is the next of our input sessions. And this, this time we have a split session, okay? So um, we're, you're gonna need to register for it if you wanna be part of things. You'll find the registration links in your email, which you'll have got uh, already for today's worship. Uh, and there you'll see the two different links where you can go on and register for the two different sessions that are happening at the same time on Wednesday night. So session one is single in a pandemic, and that's gonna be with Ross Martin and Helen Warnock. We're so grateful to have two incredible leaders uh, who are both at that same life stage uh, as part of our leadership team here at Central. And they're going to be spending some time really thinking about what it is to be, sent to be single in what has been such a challenging time uh, for single people. So that's single in a pandemic. I want to say maybe particularly too, it's not just for girls. I want to say, lads, uh, if you're single, this is for you too. Ross was really keen to stress to make sure that it wasn't just him and lots of girls, but there was a really good mixture of male and female and different, maybe different different age groups there too, uh, to be on that call. So please do think about jumping in on that if that's you. The other session which is taking place at the same time is parenting in a pandemic and we have Andy and Dana Masters from Lagan Valley Vineyard leading that session for us. Uh, and this whole idea really was triggered by um, our community leaders um, really just feeding into some of the challenges that have been taking place really in and amongst our communities in the last year and really identifying two groups of people, uh, people who were single uh, and people who were parenting uh, as people who had really significant challenges through the year of this pandemic. And we wanted to respond to that, to provide some space for you to feel heard, for you to speak, for you to input, uh, and then to get some really great input input from some really great leaders on the particular aspect that we're focusing on. So we would just really encourage you to sign up. I say as well for parents, we don't just want to extend it to parents. Maybe if you're here today and you're a grandparent too, you know what, you're also a parent and not only that, you play a really significant parenting role in the lives of your grandkids too. So we'd love to encourage you to join us on that call as well. It's happening on Wednesday night at eight o'clock. And as I say, you'll need to register. Uh, once you've registered, you will get a link on Wednesday uh, for your individual call. I wanna to say too that these are sessions really for us in house as a church. We're not throwing the net out wide, just making them public for everyone to join. It's for us as a community. So there's safe spaces so that you feel you can be honest and open and you can share yourself. And so the people that are leading these sessions can share too. So that's Wednesday night at eight, single in a pandemic, parenting in a pandemic. We would love you to register and get involved with those sessions this coming week. The last thing I want to say today is that uh, this week uh, we got official notice um, from PCI following the discussions with Stormont that we will be allowed to open uh, from Friday the 2nd 
of April. So that means that in-person gatherings for us will recommence on Good Friday. We're really excited about that. We're going to be doing communion together as a church, and that's uh, Friday the 2nd of April. And then on Sunday the 4th of April will be our first Sunday back together as a church here in the building. So would you stick those in your diary? Would you be praying for us over the next number of weeks as we drill down through the various practical arrangements that need to happen for us to open back up again? Uh, And would you think about joining us? We cannot wait to be back together as a church in this building, worshiping Jesus, lifting his name over Belfast, over our lives, over the nations again. Uh, And we're really excited to be able to do that at what is such a fundamentally important time of the year for us, which is Easter. So stick them in your diary, Friday 2nd, Sunday 4th. We cannot wait to be gathering again with you here in the building. I'm just going to pray and then I'm going to hand over to Hannah who's going to lead us in worship this morning and then to Lucy as she um, finishes off our series and devoted as she thinks about worship and community. So let's pray. Jesus, we come to you today weary. Weary that we have been in this state of play for so very long. Weary of the loneliness Weary of the fear and the anxiety. Weary of the uncertainty of the future. Weary of how narrow our worlds feel. Weary of the lack of people who have been in our lives in the last year. Weary of a lack of touch from other human beings, Lord. Lord, we are weary. We're tired. And so, God, we ask, would you meet us where we are this morning? Lord, we ask that uh, as we dig in today on worship and community, Lord, two of the most incredible and two of the most obvious ways in which we meet with you, we commune with you, we ask, God, that you might meet with us even in the detached way that we are as a church in this particular season. God, I ask you would speak through Lucy today. I ask you would speak through Hannah as they lead us. I ask that through them today, we might hear from you. We might hear your voice. We might feel your presence. We might know your goodness with us wherever we are this morning. And Lord, as we think ahead, as our world begins to open up, as we begin to dream again about the things we might do, the places we might go, the people we might meet with, Lord, I pray that you might stir us once more, Lord. Stir us to long for a country, a city, a family, a life transformed, God, that we might know that just because the world opens up, it does not mean that all our issues, all our problems, all our worries and our fears and our doubts will not subside, Lord. Rather, there may be new challenges in a new season, God, but might you equip us to be able to rush out to meet them. Jesus, equip us for days ahead. Jesus, meet us in the day we're in now. For it's in your name we pray. Amen.
Jesus, we thank you that the grave could not contain you, that you are alive, that you are our King, God, we glorify you this morning. Come and be with us in this place, in our homes. Jesus, teach us to be more like you this morning. Teach us about you. Teach us about who you are, God. Come and invade our hearts and our homes. And we give this morning over to you, Jesus. Amen. Thank you, Hannah, for leading us in worship. If you have a Bible, why don't you turn with me to Hebrews 10, 19 to 25. As part of our devoted series, this week we will be exploring the topic of community, what the Bible says about it, how we put it into practice, and why community is worship. We'll dip into a few other places in scripture, but this is a good place to start. Hebrews 10, verses 19 to 25. Therefore, brothers and sisters, since we have confidence to enter the most holy place by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way open to us through the curtain that is his body. And since we have a great priest over the house of God, let us draw near to God with a sincere heart and with full assurance that faith brings, having our hearts sprinkled to cleanse us from a guilty conscience and having our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold unswervingly to the hope we profess, for he who promised is faithful. And let us consider how we may spur one another on towards love and good deeds, not giving up on meeting together as some are in the habit of doing, but encouraging one another and all the more as we see the day approaching. Do you recognise this quote? What a sad little life, Jane. You ruined my night completely so you could have the money, but I hope now you spend it on getting some lessons in grace and decorum because you have all the grace of a reversing dump trunk, truck without any tires on. Lovely. This is a quote from a 2016 episode of Come Down With Me, which has subsequently been made into an internet meme. It's so notorious you can buy it printed on cushions and on greeting cards. If you turned into the show hoping to learn how to make a tiramisu or to fold a napkin into the shape of a swan, you'll have got more than you bargained for. Because while this show is supposed to be about dinner parties, it, like all the other types of reality TV that we like to watch, boils down to one thing, drama. No matter the format or the premise, all of these sorts of shows end up showing people getting on each other's nerves. Because when you take people with different personalities who might not always choose each other's company and unite them with one purpose and make them do life together in some capacity, this is going to happen. People of different personalities join together for one purpose, doing life together. Sounds a lot like the church. What a perfect segue. If you follow Jesus, community is what you're called to. But it's something we know all too well can be really difficult. This morning, I just wanted to remind us why community is worship by touching on four key points. The first is community is worship because it's what we're made for. If you are human, you're made for community. In their book, The Relational Soul, Richard Plass and James Cofield write this. At the core of our being is this truth. We are designed for and defined by our relationships. We were born with a relentless longing to participate in the lives of others. Fundamentally, we are relational souls. Now we may feel like we live in a time where we are supposedly more connected or able to participate in the lives of others more than ever. Text, email, WhatsApp, Facebook, Instagram, Zoom, and dare I even say it on the Sabbath day, Microsoft Teams. These form of communications have been a blessing to many over the past year. And all of these things aren't in and of themselves bad. But our consumption of social media, like all habits and practices, shapes our outlook and how we view both ourselves and each other. 
Sherry Turkle, professor of psychology, has been exploring the effects of digital worlds on human behavior for over 30 years. In her book, Alone Together, she writes this. We are lonely but fearful of intimacy. Digital connections and the social robot may offer the illusion of companionship without the demands of friendship. Our networked life allows us to hide from each other, even as we are tethered to each other. But as we long for deeper, more meaningful connections amidst, amidst our scrolling, this feeling of loneliness may be affecting us in more ways than we think. You may have heard of Dr. Vivek Murthy. He served as 19th Surgeon General of the United States from 2014 to 2017. And during this time, time, he became increasingly concerned with how many people in the country were experiencing loneliness. This may not be the first thing that springs to your mind when you think of public health, but in his book Together, Murthy discusses some of his research and explains that loneliness not only affects our mental health, but our emotional and physical health and references a long list of medical conditions and problems that are linked with being lonely. So it's clear, on a basic human level, we are called to community. We are made for community which can be seen for our longing to do so and the negative effects lack of community can have on our overall health. But if we are followers of Jesus, most importantly, we are called to community purely because Jesus says we are. Do these statements sound familiar? I love Jesus, but he at the church. My faith is a personal thing just between me and God. I get it. The relational wound may be real and fear of community may be all consuming, but hear this with grace. If you trust Jesus, trust his calling to community. Community is woven through the life of Jesus amidst the beauty of the gospels, his miracles and teaching, his death and resurrection. Jesus does life in community. Silence and solitude and time alone with God the Father are essential, but so too is community. The two are not opposed, but complementary. Both are necessary. Do you wonder what God's calling on your life is? What you're supposed to be doing and how you can do that to the best of your ability? Me too. But sometimes it's easy to lose sight of what's most important. It's easy to lose sight of the bigger picture, of the most important things we are clearly and loudly called to. In the Gospels, Jesus is asked what the most important commandment is. You'll know it. Matthew 2, 22, verses 36 to 40. Teacher, which is the greatest commandment in the law? Jesus replied, Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. And the second is like it. Love your neighbour as yourself. All the law and the prophets hang on these two commandments. The greatest commandment points to community. And Jesus constantly teaches on forgiveness, on reconciliation, on honouring and blessing others on telling others about him. None of these teachings can be achieved without a life in community. Eugene Peterson writes, whether we like it or not, the moment we become a Christian, we are the same time a member of the Christian church. Even if we do not permit our name to be placed on a church rule, even if we refuse to identify ourselves with a particular congregation and share responsibilities with them, even if we absent ourselves from the worship of a congregation, we can no more be a Christian and have nothing to do with the church than we can be a person and not be in a family. The question is not, Am I, going to be, am I going to become part of a faith community? But how am I going to become part of a faith community? Community is, in Peterson's words, part of the fabric of redemption. 
There are many ways we can express our love of God. But 1 John 5 verse 3 simply but powerfully tells us that loving God is keeping his commands. Community is essential and community is worship because it's obedience. Community is worship because it's what we are made for and what we are called to. And worship, community is worship because if we are obedient, it is where we can feel most alive. Secondly, community is worship because it's messy. What is your expectation of community? Where does it come from and how does it match reality? We may envision people holding hands in a circle singing Kumbaya, but be disappointed with the reality that it's people arguing about when to hold a meeting, about a meeting, about a meeting, about what colour to paint the church vestibule. And while it's important to dream big and aim high when it comes to community, we often love our idea of community more than we love community itself. Famously in his book, Life Together, Dietrich Bonhoeffer said, the person who loves their dream of community will destroy community, but the person who loves those around them will create community. If you've watched Mean Girls, you'll remember the infamous scene where Damien shouts, she doesn't even go here. But do you remember what the girl in question said? Quote, I wish we could all get along like we used to in middle school. I wish we could bake a cake filled with rainbows and smiles and everyone could eat and be happy. I very much doubt middle school was this harmonious, but it's easy to look back at things and romanticize them. It's easy to romanticize the early church. Yes, people were living in close community, sharing, there was self-sacrificial love and boldness and their numbers were added to daily. But if you think that there was no tension or mess and it was all rainbows and smiles, you're reading it wrong. I don't know who these perfect people were, but they certainly didn't go there. It was funny on paper, but at least it got a Mean Girls reference in. The Greek word koinonia is what community should look like. It's often used in the New Testament when we read about the community of the early church. Now, it's a word that's hard to translate, but people will often use the word fellowship. I listened to a sermon recently by Tim Mackey of The Bible Project, and he made the observation that fellowship is a word that's only ever really used in Christian circles to describe hanging out. And this couldn't be more true of the church in Northern Ireland. If there is ever any recreational or social activity, we just plaster the word fellowship on it in the hope that it will make it sound more holy. Trip to Ulster Rugby or Belfast Giants? Fellowship evening. Tray bikes and chatting? Fellowship. Soup and sandwiches in the church hall? Fellowship lunch. And it's never used outside Christian circles. When was the last time a colleague said, hey guys, how about we all pop down to the pub after work for a bit of fellowship? Never, because it's embarrassing. And I'm not saying hanging out or socializing is bad with your church family, quite the opposite. But it's the fact we use this word just to make hanging out more Christian. It implies that church is just one big social circle when we are called to so much more. The koinonia or fellowship that we are called to is deep and challenging, but so rewarding and so worth it. It incorporates sharing, sharing with others in their celebrations and sharing with them in their grief, sacrificially sharing your talents, your time, your finances and your resources, like a laptop charger when somebody's laptop dies halfway through their sermon and they don't have one. Big shout out to the Reeds. In close knit community, hurt sometimes happens as well. And it's part of being human. It's part of living in the now and the not yet. And you're, call, you're not called to stay in a place where you are a doormat or where hurt is a consistent rhythm. But while community may be the place where hurt happens, it's the only place where healing can take place. So I encourage you to find community, to build community around you where you can heal. 
John Mark Comer has recently written a short ebook called Suffering Lovingly. And this quote succinctly speaks of the messy reality of community and the essence of this koinonia. It's quite a long quote, but it's a good quote, so stick with me. He says, stay with your church, especially with your closest siblings in the family of God. Live in a thick web of interdependent relationships. Quietly defy the individualism that is wreaking havoc across the West. Surrender your autonomy to love. Place yourself in the constraint of community, for it is there we are set free. Give up your preferences for the sake of others. Enroll in the school of agape. When you feel a course, throw yourself upon God's mercy. Come back to the table, eat the bread, drink the wine, ingest the forgiving love of God, repent, repent again and again, risk vulnerability. We will get hurt and we will hurt in return. That's part of facing grace. Community is more than a soup lunch. Community is worship because in the mess we find healing, where we practice the self-sacrificial love we are called to. Thirdly, community is worship because it's diversity. 1 Corinthians 12, verses 12 to 14. Just as a body, though one has many parts, but all its many parts form one body, so it is with Christ. For we were all baptized by one spirit so as to form one body, whether Jews or Gentiles, slaves or free, and we are all given the one spirit to drink. Even so, the body is not made up of one part, but of many. Let's take another angle. Mark 10, verses 15 to 17. While Jesus was having dinner at Levi's house, many tax collectors and sinners were eating with him and the, dis- and the disciples, for there were many who followed him. When the teachers of the law, who were the Pharisees, saw him eating with the sinners and ta- tax collectors, they asked the disciples, why does he eat with tax collectors and sinners? On hearing this, Jesus said to them, it is not the healthy who need a doctor, but the sick. I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners. How diverse is the church in Northern Ireland? How diverse is each congregation? And how good are we as the body of Christ at embracing one another as denominations, as churches, as individuals and seeking diversity? Who would feel too uncomfortable to come through the doors of a church and who feels that they are unwelcome in community? When Jesus called his disciples, he said, follow me. And many did. They walked with him and the community he had around him. The 12 were called to act like brothers, not like bouncers, making inventories of people's pasts and presents and life choices and backgrounds to see if they were credible enough to join in that community with them. Yes, community is where people are transformed and where we are challenged and held accountable, but it is not our responsibility to transform others. It is our responsibility to make sure there is space at the table for transformative community to take place. The presence of community, um, the presence and community of Jesus is where people are transformed. But how often do we expect people to be transformed before they enter the presence of Jesus, before they even begin that journey? If we are really honest with ourselves, Do we really expect people to be transformed to look more like Jesus or be transformed to act more like us? Our own Christian culture or preferences or style of worship. Henry Nouwen compares Christian community to a beautiful mosaic. While each stone can be admired individually and contains its own beauty, When we step back and see all the tiny pieces, all of God's people together, it reveals a beautiful picture and reveals a story of God to the world that not one stone could tell by itself. He writes this, there are no two followers of Jesus who are the same. One of the most exciting aspects of the Christian life is that it does not put people in a mold, but creates a rich variety of people whom 
the love of God becomes incarnate in a very different way. I like to think I am inclusive and want the church to be a diverse community where everyone is welcome to join Jesus' call in this place of collective transformation. But as I was preparing, I had this thought. I was really challenged by it. You might be as well. How much grace do I extend to other believers who are not quite there yet? Who are a little bit too stuck in their ways or a little bit too conservative or not as open to the spirit or certain styles of worship or certain kinds of leadership? How quick am I to disregard the beauty of those stones in the mosaic? And who am I to set myself as the standard to be met? The 12 disciples represented diametrically opposed political and philosophical standpoints and came from very different social backgrounds. Matthew, the tax collector, was working in collaboration with the Romans and Simon, Simon was known as Simon the Zealot, the Zealots being a Jewish group open to revolution that would violently overthrow Roman rule. And you thought come down with me was awkward. Who am I to say I can't break bread with somebody who has a different political or cultural opinion than me? It's possible to disagree in love. When Jesus calls us to community, his identity and outlook is for, far more important than anything else peripheral. His rule and community challenge the tribalism and individualism fostered by secular culture. And even if we think other people's politics aren't in keeping with the way of Jesus, our outlooks are rarely challenged or changed when they're met with hostility. They're changed when they're met with grace because hostility breeds hostility, but grace breeds more grace. Community is worship because it's diverse, because the body is not made up of one part, but many. Community is worship because God can speak through anyone he wishes. So who am I to limit who I'll let him speak through in my life? Lastly, but most importantly, community is worship because it is about Jesus. Let me read the scriptures we started with one more time. Hebrews 10, 19 to 25. Therefore, brothers and sisters, since we have confidence to enter the most holy place by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way opened for us through the curtain that is his body, and since we have a great priest over the house of God, let us draw near to God with a sincere heart and with the full assurance that faith brings, having our hearts sprinkled to cleanse us from a guilty conscience and having our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold unswervingly to the hope we profess, for he who promised is faithful. And let us consider how we may spur one another on towards love and good deeds, not giving up meeting together as some are in the habit of doing, but encouraging one another and all the more as you see the day approaching. When I was given this topic and that scripture, I will be honest, I thought, this is great, but I think those verses say more about God than they do about community. But that's exactly it. That's the point. Community should say more about God than it does about us. The community we are called, called to is only possible if we have Jesus at the centre. These verses talk about community as a response to the confidence we have in God and the assurance we have in him. Community is a place where we can feel let down or hurt or undervalued and we will inevitably do the same to other people. But we are invited to join in, the, in hope of the one who will never let us down, who never forsakes us and who is continually faithful. The community God calls us to is like family. And we are all family because we are all children of God. So in order to participate in that family, we continually need to be reminded of what that means. To be a child of God is to be seen and deeply loved. And when we are confident that we are seen and loved by our heavenly father, 
Our worlds don't completely fall apart when we feel overlooked by our community. Everyone around us isn't someone we need to compete with. And our hearts aren't hostile when we are challenged in our shortcomings, but we are able to accept constructive criticism with grace. When we acknowledge that we are children of God, we see that we are completely forgiven and we are able to participate in community free of guilt and able to extend the same forgiveness to others. People often lose their faith in God as a response to how they've been treated by Christian community. Let your faith in God lead your response to Christian community. Community is worship because it's about God. It's the space between expectation and reality. And it's only possible to navigate through God's grace in a new and living way opened up for us by him and by his strength and by his spirit. Community is worship because it reminds us that when we and others fall short, God never does because he who promised is faithful. Quite often, we will finish with a response, and this week is no different. The response to community is continual and daily, but this week you will be sent a practice to pray through, which will hopefully allow you to think about some of the things we have discussed this morning on a more personal level as you pray through them with God. But I also wanted to end with an encouragement. I don't know where you're watching this morning, whether you're part of a central community or any community at all for that matter. But no matter where you are or where you're tuning in from, I just want to encourage you that community is possible and the healing power of community with Jesus at the center can be a reality. I have some golden friends beyond this church who have who I have been blessed with for years and consistently shown me the love and grace of Jesus. But when I first arrived at Central, in the Mac on a Wednesday night in 2017, I didn't expect to find community quite like this. I have been blown away by grace, by people who pray, who really pray for you, who keep you accountable, people who celebrate with you and commiserate with you, who laugh with you and cry with you, who encourage you but also tell you what you need to hear, even when sometimes it's not what you want to hear. People that sit with you on a carpet eating chili or on a sofa as you drink coffee or as a, at a table as you read the Bible or in the prayer ministry corner as you ugly cry your heart out or people that just sit with you where you are at in your hoping and in your dreaming or in your doubt or in your grief or in your heartache. People who love you just as you are, not as they think you should be. People that show you Jesus. Thank you. This is not a central thing. This is a God thing. I'm not sharing this as an endorsement of this community. I'm sharing this to say, wherever you are, whoever you are, community is possible if you just lean in. It's vulnerability, it's commitment, it's a daily choice. Community is never perfect, but there is no better way to live. Let me pray for you as we close. Jesus, we just thank you that you are our heavenly father who loves us deeply. We just pray this week that you would reveal to us who we are in your eyes. And from that, all our actions, our view, how we treat others and how we view ourselves would just be shaped by that, by your eyes. Holy Spirit, we just invite you into our homes, into our lives, into our situations, to just navigate how we participate in community with others. God, we ask that you give us wisdom, that you encourage us, that you put kind words on our mouths to encourage others with. God, we just pray that we would see the good in people. 
And Holy Spirit, we just ask you to minister to pain. We ask you to minister to hurt. We just pray as a people, as a community, as communities, we would just be people that foster your grace and your love. We thank you that community isn't easy, that it involves vulnerability and hard work, but it is worth it. Jesus, we thank you for the example that you give us of life lived in community through the Gospels, through Jesus' community and interactions with others. And we just pray that we would continually draw back to your word, that we would continually be guided by your Spirit as we do this. Holy Spirit, you're so welcome in our homes. You're so welcome in our community. Help us be a people of community. Help us be a people that foster community in your city. Amen. <laughs>